so I'm going to go ahead and just jump in. And um, so today uh, we have a special guest. We have Josh Anderson. And um, the reason I chose him, and Josh may not even know this, but um, he was actually my very first referral partner when I came to KW. I sent him a referral four and a half years ago. It was the very first one I ever sent anybody through the KW system. Nice. You don't even know. remember that, do you? My guy yeah. never transacted, but we're still friends. And uh, yeah. one day he will be moving there. And by the time he moves there, he'll have a lot more money so he can spend, buy something nicer. I like it. Yeah. I, I remember you referring him, but I don't, I didn't realize that was your very first uh, referral through command, I guess. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah, that was my first one. And then I finally met Josh in person last year at a family reunion. I think we were both in Gary's mastermind and got to meet him there. And of course was in, impressed with him. And I think he thinks a lot like I do. We're kind of, uh, you know, kindred spirits that way, very logical and analytical. And Josh has an amazing business in Nashville, Tennessee. So I wanted to bring him on for you guys to pick his brain and hear his story a little bit. And uh, Josh, I'll just throw it over to you if you want to just tell us a little bit about yourself and your background. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, so I got into real estate. So I've been with Keller Williams um, the whole time I've been real estate. I got into the business in 2006, so April of 2006. So I'm about to start my 17th year in the business. And, um, you know, I so just kind of pro progressing over time, like the last since 2019, we've kind of crossed over that 100 million or more mark between 100 million in volume to 150 million. Um, we've got a small team. Um, right now, we've got uh, a couple of agents, myself and a couple of other agents, and then um, a small administrative team and a couple of virtual assistants in the background. So, and you know, most of our business is probably, probably like several people on the, on the call, our business has always been primarily some type of referral. So 70, 70 to 75 percent of our business is always an agent referral from somebody uh, around the country that has clients moving here or or a past client or sphere. Uh, that's just that's just how our business has always been. I love yeah. that and that definitely says something about you that people want to come back and they want to refer people to you. Yeah. So I think that's a huge testimonial in and of itself you know, aside from any reviews online, which I know you have a ton of those too, but uh, just knowing that your business comes from that says a lot about you and your team. Yep. And uh, Josh, you're, you're kind of humble. I know you're, you're, you're not, uh, you know, bragging about your numbers or anything, but you know, you've done an amazing job. Um, according to Zillow, which I know that's not even up to date, but you've done over 2,500 transactions. So I don't know what your real number is, but congratulations. That's amazing. Yeah, it's somewhere, I, you know, I don't know the exact numbers, but it's somewhere in the, it's somewhere in 20, 2000 to 2500 transactions. And um, so we're, you know, we're, we, we stay busy. Uh, but, you know, I, I also feel like it's one of those things that, you know, it, it has a lot to do with kind of the, the back end of our team, the administrative uh, piece of it and the systems and processes we have in place, which I think really allows us to run. And I think that, I think that matters whether you're, you know, a luxury business or you're just uh, kind of somewhere in between or or even on the lower end of the market. I think those systems really, really matter. I completely agree with you. I think it doesn't matter the price point. Whatever you're doing, a system definitely helps it go smoother and make it a repeatable process so that you're not recreating the wheel every time. Right. Yep. Awesome. So um, tell us, what is your average price point? So our average price point in 2022 was about 650. Um, so it's, so, you know, and I think we, we've talked about this in the, you know, uh, when we jumped on the phone yesterday, we were talking about, you know, our business, we do quite a bit of luxury business, but we've never kind of pigeonholed ourselves into just the luxury market or just the investor market. Uh, because our clients, you know, they sometimes start out as first-time home buyers and they move up into that luxury market. And along the way, they want to keep a couple of their properties or acquire properties. So um, overall, our average is 600, 650000 which, you know, is 
for the for the market, we're closer to about four hundred thousand as an average price point in Nashville, Middle Tennessee area. Okay, and I think that's important for everybody to note that he is, um, you know, he's covering different price points. He's not just strictly luxury and. Um, I think that's important for everybody to know because a lot of us live in areas where there is a mix and we can do a lot of business in multiple markets, not just luxury or not luxury. So um, I think that's important for everybody to realize that that is a possibility. That is something that we can do and do it successfully. Yeah. Um, and Kim, uh, yes, my books are color coded. My wife's an interior designer. So all my <laughs> behind me are <laughs> That's great. Um, yeah, no, I think it's really important. To, um, the reason I've never pigeonholed myself just to luxury is I think when the luxury market's good, it's great. And I think when it changes, it changes pretty dramatically. And I think people only see the upside of like when it's a good market. But when it's, you know, we've got, I was looking this morning, we've got 345 properties. So essentially 350 properties in Nashville, Franklin, or Brentwood, uh, over $1.5 million that are that are just sitting. You know, some of them are new construction, some a lot of them are resales, but that's not even three or four counties. That's just three main areas that people might move to um, of all the counties that make up Middle Tennessee. So, so Josh, I think that's kind of a nice segue right into how do you prevent having houses just sit on the market? Like, what is your strategy to make sure that you're not that guy? You're not that guy holding those properties. Yeah, you know, I I think um, part, well, I think the answer could, could go in so many directions, but I think a lot of it has to do with understanding and knowing the market. And over time, just, you know, I don't think any of us can know all the zip codes and all the neighborhoods but I think we can be familiar enough with them and then go dig really heavily before we go on a listing appointment, um, calling agents that have uh, properties currently in that area or in that neighborhood. Uh, but I think, it's, I think it's a lot of conversations with your clients and educating them that the market, hey, the market isn't what it was 12 or 15 months ago. Um, regardless of where you are, the market's not what it was 15 months ago. We're not at 2.75 or three and a half percent interest rates. We're at 6.33 today or whatever the number is. And, you know, when, when rates double, it doesn't matter. People, you know, there's been a, there was definitely a lag period, at least in Nashville, you know, when the rates essentially doubled between the start of 2022 and, and the May timeline, um, the rest of 2022, I mean, you had two distinct markets in 2022 the lower interest rates and, and the higher interest rates. And I'm sure there were a lot of sub markets in between there um, within all of our cities. But my point is that we had two majorly different markets in 2022. Mm -hmm. And now for us, at least January one feels like people have come to the realization that the, the rates aren't gonna go back down, but you can do an adjustable rate mortgage and be at 5% interest rate today and still you know get what you want and they're, you know, things are a little bit better of a deal than they were 15 months ago or 12 months ago. Um, so I think that makes a big difference. But rates really are that powerful that you double the rate and, you know, people's mortgage payments are going up dramatically. Right. And how does that affect your your price points as you go higher and higher into luxury? Is it is it becoming, does it become a little bit less important when you hit a certain point? Um, cause I know your, your luxury goes all the way up to, you know, five, 6 million, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, I'm working with a couple of people that are looking in the five to 6 million range right now, along with several people that are looking above two and a half. And, you know, it's interesting, historically speaking, I think a lot of those people, um, would get financing and it feels like at least in our market, there's more cash than there's ever been. Um, certainly still a lot of people getting financing. But when you get above that two or two and a half million mark, it seems like a lot of people are paying cash for things, or at least have the opportunity to put, you know, at least 50% down, if not just paying cash. And I think when you're paying cash in that price point, and, you know, those people are already really picky, and they already know exactly what they want. But I think that they can sit around and wait and see what the recession does. Um, they're not in a hurry. It's not like they're living in a terrible house in today, you know, today, 
Um, so they, they don't have to move. They just like to move because they usually, they have enough disposable income to have what they want. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. I, I hear you on that. And are you seeing that when they pay cash or a lot of them then um, refinancing or financing later on? Um, so they're using the power of the cash up front and then pulling the equity out afterwards? Yeah, I would say, you know, a lot of these people are probably doing some kind of equity line or something on their property anyway. Um, I'm also seeing a lot more people, whether it's in Nashville or other places, but it feels like more people in the luxury market are buying, maybe they have more faith in real estate investments than they have in the past. Um, I feel like, and, and maybe COVID accelerated that idea, but I have more clients open to the uh, possibility or idea of buying million plus dollar investment properties or Airbnbs. And, um, you know, it's, it's like, Hey, can I pay for the, can I pay for the investment? Um, mm -hmm. or, or they're just looking for, you know, I don't want a $500,000 investment. Maybe it's a million and a half dollar investment. And I, I'm getting, you know, eight or $10,000 a month in rent. I mean, I'm, I'm amazed at how crazy rents are in Nashville. Um, I've got multiple clients that are renting their house for anywhere, their previous home for anywhere from like 8,000 to like $12,000 a month. Yeah. And I look at we, the house and go, it's a nice house, but I would never pay. I would never pay 12 grand to live there per right. month. And that's almost yep. $100,000 a year in a, in a rent payment. So yeah, you've got to have a lot of disposable income to, to afford that and to want to do that. So we're seeing the same thing here with the rents have just gone crazy here as well. Um, it'll be interesting to see if that, how that turns back around. Yeah, for sure. So I know everybody's dying. You know, the, the thing everybody always wants to know is where do you get your luxury clients from? Like what, what is your, what are your top three sources for luxury clients? I know you said a lot of referrals. Is that um, the same for luxury? Yeah. I mean, so, so, as an umbrella, I would just say it's, it's, I mean, nobody wants to hear this, but it's, it's working your database, right? I mean, I, I have never in 17 years really worked a geographic location. I've always worked my database demographically. Mm -hmm. um, and I just felt like these are the type of clients that I want, or I'm in this networking group, or I'm a member of this country club. And so being able to connect with those people. And then, you know, they're not referring people, they're referring other similar people. Mm -hmm. So if you're really asking me, I mean, it's the answer is database generically, but if you're asking me to dig into that database and go, where are my best referral sources? I would probably tell you, um, you know, if I, if I named my top two or three referral sources as people, they're in the music industry. Um, and then if I told you overall, it's financial advisors wealth managers, mm -hmm. hands down, no question. If I could only pick one source to work really hard, it'd be financial advisors. Interesting. I, I love hearing everybody's different stories about what they do and what, what works for them. Yeah. So um, how are you, are you rewarding them in any way? Do you have some kind of follow-up plan that you're, you know, touching base with them every so many days or what is that? What does that look like? Yeah. You know, I, so we we have a system for everything, and I would tell you a, a little bit generically, my my referrals get month, people that refer me business agents are are quarterly, but like local people that refer me business, I talk to them typically. It's it's monthly. Um, mm -hmm. but then within that group, that might be somebody that just refers me one deal a year, um, but the people that have become friends or refer me a lot, I mean, I might some of them I talk to three or four times a week. Mm -hmm. So it's really, it's really kind of case by case. I mean, you know, I've got, we all have like random one-off referrals that we get. And then we also have people that just refer us a ton of business mm -hmm. or, or a lot more than everybody else. I mean, I have some people in my, you know, in my world that refer me a lot of business and not very much of it closes, but it's like, they refer me a lot of opportunities. Um, and it's really and that's okay because I want to be, I would like to be the go-to for all things real estate and that takes more time, but you know, I don't do commercial real estate, but I have about 12 different commercial real estate agents that are past clients that I can 
refer that person to if they need it. So I want to be I want to be the, the the guy for when somebody says I need real estate. Um, but there's a lot of times we don't we get a lot of referrals that don't close because like mine. Yeah, like mine I mean, never closed. <laughs> but there's nothing wrong with that. It's it's it, you're rewarding the activity, not the outcome. And I think people get caught up in doing the opposite. And I'm always stop everything you do and call that person and thank them for the referral and let them know you'll update them as we get through the process. But you're rewarding that activity over time and not the actual outcome. Because mm -hmm. you're missing a lot of opportunities if you're rewarding the outcome. Absolutely. I, I completely agree with you. Um, so what does that look like? Are you using any of these programs like AM cards or Client Giant? Is that the one? Something like that? Yeah, I think we've probably looked at all of them, to be honest. I, you know, we we make our own kind of referral boxes in-house and they're all things Nashville, like all local, you know, they're like, they're basically a local box. Nice. Um, it could be, um, it could be drinks, it could be candies, it could be foods, it could be candles, it could be just, just a combination of things. And there's like different there's different types based on the referral. Um, we send a lot of them to our agent referral partners and, and have over the years. Uh, we go in and out of sending lots of them. So it's, but it's, we, we don't do, I don't know, I guess we could automate and do the client giant stuff or whatever am cards, but I do the good old handwritten notes and mm -hmm. that's yeah. So, you know, I think systems are awesome. And I also think there's times when you just got to get back to the old school boring, basic. My business is very basic. Um, and I think that's part of what, it's not super sexy, but I think um, I think that's part of what makes it be able to stand the test of time. I've, I've literally been doing the same things for 17 years. And, and I didn't, people still love it. They still love it. They loved it then and they love it now. Yeah, but it's very easily, like it's, it's just, it's simple, but most people don't want to do the activities. Like when I got into the business, Gary was like, you do two hours of lead generation a day. And then we went into the shift of 2008, 9, and 10. He was like, it's got to be three hours a day. And then we came out of that and he was like, you got to do four hours a day. And so my business has always kind of looked the same. I pick up the phone for three to four hours a day, every single day, Monday through Friday. Mm -hmm. it, it sounds to me like your uh, a lot of your lead gen may not be calling directly to clients and and people that you're going to buy and sell, but actually the people that will refer you. So you've got like two sets of prospecting, if you will. Yeah, yeah, it's it's um, it's it's referrals. I'm 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 calling a lot of past clients, a lot of seller leads that have just inquired over time, and then a lot of referral agent referrals and referral sources. So it's kind of three pronged approach right. and people always like people on my team are like, well, what do you, what do you call all day? And it's like, well, I built my database big enough of past clients and referral sources that I don't have to go call expireds or do open houses. But until you get to that point, your, your lead gen has to look like a stool or a chair. It has to have three or four legs. Right. Right. And when you've closed 2000, 2,500, deals, you've got a good sized database of people to reach out to, um, you know, no matter where they are in the country, there's still people that could be referring you business from when they lived close to you. Right. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Um, do you have any like surprise and delight programs like Brady always talks about? Like, so during your luxury transactions, do you do the gifting? You know, we've gone we've gone in and out of doing that. Um, and we actually just talked about it two weeks ago. So the one thing that we took, I, I love the surprise and delight. I think where we're at, it would be hard to implement at the level that I want to implement. Cause when I implement something, I'm all in. And so we've, um, we kind of left it up to our administrative team and said, you have, you know, up to 75 or a hundred dollars. I forgot what it is. Um, to spend on client a client every week, mm -hmm. um, just just because they're the ones that are really, I mean, you know, the agents do a great job of connecting and communicating and showing them properties, but the administrative teams really who's holding their hand to the closing table. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and that's the, that's the, the, um, I just think if we want systems implemented, they're the ones that are going to do it consistently and at the level that we want done. So um, we've given them the opportunity to spend money. And so when somebody goes, hey, you know, my dream trip, and we also do VIP intake forms. And so we know a lot of information about them. Mm -hmm. It's having that data and being able to use it. But, you know, if we know um, they their dream trip is the Amalfi Coast, we're probably, you know, unless they refer me a lot of deals, I'm not sending them to the Amalfi Coast. <laughs> But, you know, we can go spend $100 on a really awesome coffee table book that's all things Amalfi Coast that I feel like um, they can look at. And every time they look at it, they think of us. Mm -hmm. So it's just, and that's not really their closing gift. It's just another, it's just, or somebody's having a tough day or a tough week, or they're super stressed out, then we can go get them, you know, whatever, a candle or a massage or, you know, whatever it is. And I think those are important little touches that you really have to be paying attention to and listening. Yeah, I agree. Now, who on your team is the one actually doing that? Because it is somebody that has to, one, have the time to do it, two, be creative enough to come up with an idea at the drop of a hat. So who's actually in charge of that? Um, I'd say overall that who's in charge of it is director of operations, but you know, she's she's communicating with, I mean, she's really getting that information from the listing manager or the transaction coordinator. Okay. Because it, and, and again, the reason I said we haven't fully committed to a whole surprise and delight thing is it is a whole nother person and it requires everybody. And we all know if you have agents on your team, they go in and out of the, you know, we'd all love to say that everybody communicates at a level internally and externally that, that we expect, and it just doesn't happen all the time. Right. So, um, but it, it requires information from the agents in real time, and it requires information from the um, administrative team in real time. Because mm -hmm. yeah. if you heard something and you get to closing, you're like, oh, yeah, they mentioned that it, three weeks ago. Well, <laughs> it's kind of late now. Yeah. I mean, it's you could still do it, but it wouldn't be the same. Like, it right. wouldn't have the same effect. Yeah. And, and Josh, I don't know if you're like we were during the pandemic. We we didn't have time. We didn't have time to go shopping for anything or order anything, even on Amazon. We were just like scrambling to just keep up and get to closing. Well, and I think that's the hard part is you'd almost have to have you'd almost have to have like a part time person that was just at your beck and call type thing um, mm -hmm. to, to really implement it the way that I would want to implement it. Right. And so I think that's really hard. I think we were just, for a lot of teams and a lot of people, we were just trying to figure out what the heck's going on in during COVID. Right. I mean, you know, we, I don't know about with you, we, we had deals that were going, you know, four and $500,000 over asking price. And I know that that everybody had all these crazy offers, but I mean, when, a, when a house sells 50 or 60% above asking price, it's just like, what just happened? Right. And so you're so in that transaction that you're like, I okay, I don't, I don't have time to do anything else. Right. I feel like now we've kind of hit a part, a point in the market where we can kind of step back again and look at, okay, what did we stop doing during the pandemic that we can start, you know, we can reinvigorate it and um, really take a look at it. Um, so I, I'm excited about going to family reunion because I think a lot of those basics will be on stage and we'll, we'll hear a about a lot of them again. And it'll remind us of some of the things we may have forgotten over the last couple of years because we were so busy. And I think the cool part about family reunion, you always, you know, nothing really new is being talked about. It's really, you know, somebody took a system that we've all heard about and they put, a, you know, a special twist on it or they added something here or there and you're like, dang, that's, that's awesome. I didn't think about that. Um, or they flipped it, you know, they just, um, so I think it's good to hear these things, but I don't think we're going to go and hear new information necessarily. I think it'll be updated information. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's kind of a reminder of things we, we may have forgotten over the years or that we, we got too busy for. So hopefully we'll get reinvigorated, right? That's right. That's right. <laughs> All right. Um, how about client events? Do you guys do any client events? We do. Um, and we always do. So we do, basically we do one a quarter. Um, we used to do six. 
and and we've also done lots of little micro events and you know um so we've kind of revamped our so so we're really kind of doing one a quarter and then we're doing other things where you know more collaborations online instagram linkedin facebook stuff and then we're also doing community events and we're not doing a ton of community events but we're trying to do things monthly kind of you know giving back is one of our five core values and the idea is give where you live so mm -hmm. it could be, you know, it could be Second Harvest Food Bank, which we've done a couple of times, or it could be like one of our clients that started a nonprofit and just go make food for the homeless and give it out on Monday nights. Um, so it's, those weren't really client events. I just like to mention those because I think that it's strategic giving. Mm -hmm. and I don't know that there's really anything more powerful from a PR perspective. And I think this is why Gary and KW does so much with KW Cares is you can't pay for that marketing. I mean, you, so being able to give back on a monthly basis with the team showing up and, and just, you know, on a random Tuesday or a Thursday when we could be in the office working, um, feels good to be able to, to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and then as far as our client events, I mean, kind of name it, we've done everything, right? So it's, yeah, I mean, we've done things as simple as, you know, pie days and pizza giveaways, and we've done, um, you know, lots of giveaways like Mother's Day giveaways and Father's Day giveaways. Um, but our big, our big client event that we that I do personally for my referrals, this isn't even really kind of an Anderson group. It's kind of for me. I I invite about our, you know, about fifty people a year, so it's about twenty five couples to a dinner at my house. Um, nice. it's it's relatively expensive I mean it's usually a 10 to 15 thousand dollar event wow um, but it's but it's custom everything it's like they're they're going and pulling the lettuce for the salad like on Saturday morning you know and if you've ever eaten a salad that was literally pulled three or four hours before you eat it it's very different than I mean it's amazing so so I that is our that is my big client event um every year wow so, that sounds amazing i want to be is. one of your clients but you know and it's funny because people are like oh my god that was amazing i want to you know and i they all know like it to stay on the list you have to send me a referral <laughs> but it's, it's um so it does i mean the list does change but the core group is always the same a lot of them are friends of mine and have been clients for a long time and they refer me business um so it's it's pretty awesome, but they do, they do know the deal. So. I love that. I love that. And it's so nice when your clients become your friends and now you're, you know, you're meshing the two together. So it's no longer work to call them. It's now becoming part of your social life, your sphere. And, and it's just easy. It's a lot easier when you're now friends. Well, and that's where our client events have kind of evolved too. I, we've done all the things and I'm just like, all right, you know, what would I show up for? And what, like, if I'm going to spend the money, what do, what do myself and the team think are cool events that we'd go to? So like, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's inviting all your clients, but the first 50 people that RSVP get to do, you know, a singer songwriter night. And we just, we just buy 50 tickets. And so it might not be for 500 people or a thousand people. Um, but I think it's doing things that we we already think would be cool and that we would go to. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we've done we've done the baseball, you know, baseball games and the football games for the Titans and the so we we've done all the things and they're fun. But I've just gotten to the point where like we I love all the ideas within Keller Williams, but I've also gotten to the point where it's like, what do I think is cool? <laughs> or, or, or collectively, what does the team think is cool that they would show up for and be like, this is awesome. Yeah, I agree with you, Josh. I think for me and my team, events have not been a huge part of our business. We've done them, um, but it it's so important that the team is on board and that they think it's cool or you're, it's like pulling teeth to get to the, to the finish line. So yeah. I think that's really important to keep in mind. What does your team want to do and what would they enjoy? Yeah, and so I was talking to somebody um, 
last week that I was like, man, I want to enter their contest. So they they do a, a client <laughs> giveaway. And it was like dinner at a Michelin star restaurant and a, oh. a, a racing or driving experience before that. And I'm like, I've done the Ferrari portion Lamborghini racing experience and it's awesome. I mean, it is unbelievable. Um, so to do that and then go, you know, date night at a Michelin star restaurant, I'm like, that's pretty cool. And those are the kind of things that we've, we've started doing from a giveaway or like team activities, like, um, you know, just whatever it is, like, I, I want to do a team, um, a team uh, outing with just the, the Lamborghini race experience, just because I think it, I had fun, <laughs> like total, total adrenaline. Um, but, you know, we ask, we ask, I always ask my wife, like, all right, we're going to do a Mother's Day giveaway. What, what is ridiculous that you probably wouldn't buy for yourself that you really would like? You know, the mm -hmm. first one we did was a Dyson supersonic hairdryer. And I'm like amazed that somebody would spend $500 on that. But we had like 400 people sign up for it. Wow. It because nobody, I mean, when you think about a hairdryer, like most people spend probably 50 to a hundred bucks. I don't know. Yep. Um, I didn't know that hairdryers were $500. I recently found that out too. I didn't know either. Uh, so what is, how are you getting that message out there that people are registering? Is it mostly social media, email blasts? So it's emails, um, text campaigns, it, depending on what it is. Um, you know, we have some, we have them kind of segmented out. We've done like, we've done like the bold call in, we've done yep. fill out the survey or fill out the form. Um, and you get extra entries if you give us the reviews and all the things. So it really just, uh, it depends on the type of giveaway. If it's just a normal client event, it's um, it's probably like an Eventbrite type. Mm -hmm. And then it's follow-up texts and phone calls and things like that. Um, for like my dinner party, it's just like we get like 100% attendance because they get, you know, a nice cardstock invitation in the mail. Um, yeah. So, I mean, it just well, depends. I would definitely come if you invited me. So, Perfect. I understand. <laughs> All right. Perfect. Awesome. Um, so, I know you have a team and I know you have high standards. So, how do you hold all of your agents and your team members to the same high standards that you have? Um, how do I say this? And uh, I, <laughs> I don't, it's really difficult. I, it like there's times I just take my head and bang it against that brick wall. You know, it's like, no, I, it, it's tough. I mean, we, it's hard for us to grow and keep that intact. Mm -hmm. And it's hard, it's hard. For, I have to, I have to, I have to bite my tongue and pick my battles, I guess, a little bit. Um, you know, I, probably the same, probably the same issues you have or anybody else has. It's, it's tough. Yeah. Um, it's, it's constant training. It's constantly talking about what our expectations are and what our standards are. And if this is what you, if you want to be on the team, this is what you got to do. I love that. I love your honesty, Josh, because we all, we all suffer from that. And, uh, you know, no I, think matter anybody, how I think anybody that says anything different is completely full of crap. To be <laughs> I mean, Listen, I'd love to sit here and say it's all amazing and we don't have any of those issues. We have those issues every day, multiple times a day. It just mm -hmm. is what it is. Um, I don't think it ever goes away. My business coach, you know, he, I complain to him and then he, it's like a therapy session and he's like, look, you're dealing with humans. You need to decide which set of problems you want to have. I love that. I love that. It's, I remember that. Well, I mean, it really, it's true. It's like you, you can pick and choose which problems you have when you're dealing with other humans. Right. So That's cool. I love that. So I'm going to open it up I'm, for. Yeah. Maybe I'm unrealistic on my standards. I don't know. <laughs> well, sometimes we have to look at that too, right? Some days right. I think to myself, is that really that important? Right. So yep. there's part of that too. Um, I'm going to open it up for questions in just a second. Um, I will say, Josh, I know you have an amazing website. 
I've seen that. Um, I think you did a really great job with that. So anybody needs website ideas, go to his website and uh, send him some referrals. It's a great website. I'm sure of the website, what do you guys do for social media? Like, do you have somebody that you pay to do social media? What, what does that look like for you? Yeah, we're kind of in between right now. So I've always struggled. Like I want everybody in house. Um, and I, marketing is a really difficult thing. It's this big, massive umbrella. And it's like everything in real estate outside of, you know, writing an offer and negotiating an offer. I mean, everything can kind of fall under marketing. Mm -hmm. And what I found when you have somebody in-house on marketing is they're usually good at like two or three things. And then everything else they really either struggle with, they don't love, so they don't gravitate to it. So we we do not have an in-house person. Instead, we've got like three different people that are kind of piecemealed out that are that we just, you know, pay monthly retainers to mm -hmm. for video, um, for Instagram. And so we'd love to find the person in-house, but we're we're realizing that that's really difficult to do. So um, we do have, we have it kind of outsourced. And, um, you know, I think if people went to our, um, our Instagram for our businesses, tag Nashville, it just stands for, you know, the Anderson group Nashville. Um, so it's tag Nashville. And then mine is just the real Josh Anderson um, on Instagram. And I think what people will see is, I think the one thing we do good on on branding and, and marketing is I think it feels a lot different than most agents. And I don't know how to explain it. I just feel like we do a good mix of like highlighting our clients, highlighting areas of Nashville, highlighting the agents on the team and just doing different things like, hey, here's here's five things you can do for Valentine's Day and having that as a blog on our website and then creating you know, a post out of it to push people back and forth. But it's not like, hey, I've got a new listing at 123 Main Street. Uh, I think if people wanted to see all of that, they would just go to Zillow or Realtrax or MLS or whatever your local stuff is. Um, I think it's cool to highlight really cool parts of houses, like, you know, outdoor entertainment space or an outdoor kitchen or something that's unique or different, whether mm -hmm. it's views or something. Um, but I don't think people always want to just see the same thing over and over of all of our listings. Um, and there's, we have really awesome listings. And we also have, like I posted one a while back that I was like, you know, it's basically, a, it is a massive fixer upper. And so they're not all super sexy. Sometimes they're, you know, one of our clients that has a $3 million house inherited a $300,000 property from a family member. And that's the reality of real estate is sometimes they're not all $3 million properties. Sometimes they're $250 or $300,000 junkers. Yep. I, I hear you. Sounds to me like you're trying to put out uh, more value to people, not just look at me, look at me, but this is yeah. trying to provide some value to people with some, you know, in, local information, um, creative ideas of what they could do with their space based on the properties that you have, things like that. So it's not just all about Josh and his team. It's about right. providing value. Yeah. And it's that. taking pictures and doing, you know, like we did, we did second harvest food bank and it's like just, you know, tagging them and kind of collaborating and it's just being purposeful about what we're putting out and try, and we are trying to add value mm -hmm. because I feel like the world we live in, like you have to give as much value as possible and you have to do it really quickly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. So. All right, Josh, I want to open it up for some questions. I saw a couple of them jumping up in the chat. Um, I don't know if you can see them or if you want us to yeah. read them, we can. What type of conversation are you having with your luxury clients to create expectations in today's market? You know, I think it's, um, I think it's a lot of ongoing conversations. I think it depends a little bit on what the conversation's about, but you know, I, I'm telling people just what I said at the start of this is the, the market's different than it was a year ago. Interest rates are twice what they were. And I think those are the conversations. And the reality is, look, we can, we can list your property wherever you want. We're still going to know in a, the first couple of weeks on the market, whether you're priced correctly or not. So a, a really good example of a, of a, seller um, didn't know the guy. He he had his property previously listed with another agent uh, for a million bucks. And he uh, we listed his property. So one of the newer guys on my team likes to call expires. And 
you know, I was telling you, he, he also called a $9 million expired that we went on the appointment for. And so anyway, this, this guy had a million dollars. We list his property. We had 27 showings and no offers. And so I called the guy and I said, look, man, I said, you know, typically when we get that many showings in the first two or three weeks, it just means we're probably three to 5% off on price. My recommendation is to list your property for 900,000. That was my original recommendation at the listing appointment. And he didn't want to do it. And he said, Josh, lowering it to 899 or 900 is not going to do anything. Okay, this conversation was a Thursday afternoon, literally this past Thursday. And by Saturday midday, we had seven offers on his property from lowering it from 929 to 899.9. And so the conversations are just, they're no different in my opinion than they have been over the last at least for me, they've not been any different than they have for the last 15 plus years. And the conversations are know the market well enough to be able to regurgitate it to the average consumer. And when I say the average consumer, there's a lot of average consumers that are multimillionaires. Like just because they make, you know, they buy a $3 million house doesn't mean that they know more than you. They, mm -hmm. they typically don't. Um, I've got a lot of clients that make a lot of money that still call me and go, dude, tell me what's going on. Like, I don't understand what the market's doing. I need you to tell me, like, give me the cliff notes. Um, and so I know that's probably not a good answer to the question, but I've always tried to educate and add value. And so my conversations haven't really changed. I'm just continuing to tell people, like filter out the BS and just tell them the truth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Josh, for us, I think that we're seeing that we have to have those conversations a lot faster than we used to have to have them because the market's changing so quickly that if we sit and wait, we're going to be priced out of the market very quickly. I don't know if you're seeing that in your area, but for us, it's like we have to have those hard conversations yeah, as soon as we can. Yeah. And so and so that's that's the deal is like we're checking in. You know, I've always checked in multiple times a week with my with my seller clients specifically because even if we don't have showings i'm calling just to check in hey i know we don't have any showings i'm still working on getting people through the door but the second that people start telling themselves a story in their head and they start creating that story because they haven't heard from you mm -hmm. you are going to lose that listing no news is bad news just call them and say hey I was thinking about you. I drove by your property. I know I owe you a phone call. I just wanted to check in. What questions do you have? Hey, do you have 10 minutes to go over the market and what I think, what our next step should be, what we should do to reposition the property, whatever it is. Listen, nobody wants to hear that their property is overpriced, but they're not stupid. They know, they know whether their property is overpriced or not. And if they don't hear from you, and I think that's one of the big problems in real estate is like, I think a lot of sellers, not in the luxury market per se, but like just generally speaking, I think a lot of sellers love for people to do open, for agents to do open houses yeah. mm -hmm. because it's tangible. They can see us physically doing an open house, right? Well, there's so many, I mean, think about how many other things we do for our clients that they never see or hear about. Right. Because we don't need to, I mean, we don't tell them typically. Um, and so they need to see tangible stuff. And if they're not hearing from us or they're not getting emails or texts, and I don't think an email and a text can replace picking up the phone and mm -hmm. calling and hearing their voice or them hearing your voice. So I think all that stuff's really important. Call them twice as much as you otherwise would. Don't let a week or two go by because it gets weird, weird. And they've already told themselves a story right. of why it's not selling and what all things you're not doing. I love that because it's definitely always our fault if it's not selling, right? It's always the agent's fault. So always, absolutely, uh, you know, make, calling them with nothing to say but other than just to check in is so important. And it's it's actually kind of the counterintuitive for most agents. They actually want to do the opposite. If nothing's happening, they don't want to call because they have nothing to say, right? Yeah, that's right. Awesome. All right. Do we have any other questions here? Um, how do you keep your listings from being stale in terms of making each one a different marketing look? It seems our listings have gone the same look, same route lately. Um, 
you know, any, uh, I don't know how to answer that question. I mean, I think for one, um, I've always been a proponent of staging homes, but because my wife's a stager and a designer. <laughs> So, and, and I've also seen like, even before she was like officially doing it, she was kind of doing it for me and I know the power of it, but um, I think, I think having a good stage, like, I guess where I was going with that is I'm getting to the point where if my clients don't want to stage a property, I'm like the hell with it. I'll pay for the staging. And I don't really like to do that, but if I know I'm competing on a staging I'm more willing to do it one because my wife's a stager and that's the stager we're going to use. Um, because I know what her what her abilities are. Um, and if you ever want to look her up, it's Homestyle of Nashville, just to get ideas from your for your stager or your designers. She's, she, you know, she's got about 35 to 40 houses worth of furniture in the warehouse. And I think that's one of the things we do to keep it from going sales. I, I can't list houses that are vacant or like have very little, even, even if we use some of their furniture, we bring in accessories, whether it's art, um, flowers, vases, some kind of texture, some kind of something, like even if it's throw pillows, I don't, we got to bring in something that goes along with their stuff. Um, and if they'll move their furniture out, um, um, we're totally staging. So I don't know if that really answers your question, but um, I, I'm, my marketing look is my marketing look. Um, I think having great photos, great videos, twilight photos, all those things or what help us to keep it from being stale. And I do think you have to update and do every once in a while. I mean, if you look at my stuff from even 2015 or 16, I feel like, God, why did we do that? You know, it's like, you're always evolving your marketing and, and, and any kind of branding. Even if your logo stays the same, generally speaking, you're, you're playing around with it and repackaging it. And so. I yeah. Know, I, I agree with you, Josh. One th we, I, I pulled up an old listing of mine the other day and I thought, oh my gosh, that's what I used to put out there. And those were like good pictures, you know, even five or seven or 10 years yeah, ago. They were amazing yeah. pictures. And now yeah, I'm like, oh amazing. my gosh. Yeah. But now they're like all grainy and nasty looking. You're like, oh yeah. I don't even know. How did that happen? I don't know. I'm like, can we take all those down? I don't want those out there anymore. Yeah. So um, maybe you had a question on best places to market, market a four and a half million dollar house. Um, not getting showings, that's really hard to give you an answer without knowing your market and not knowing the type of property and what the average price point. And, but, you know, I, I, I think that's hard. I mean, it, if you're not getting any showings, um, so the listing appointment I went on two weeks ago, 12,500 square foot house on 60 acres, and he wants 8700 $75,000 or whatever it was. I couldn't find a comp, a penny over five. Um, and so it's like, I'll list his property, but I'm going to list it for $5 million. And I think that if you're that far on four and a half million, if that's, if that's four, you know, four, almost $4.2 million above your average price point in your market, you know, you got to look at the absorption rate and go, how many four and a half million dollar houses per year sell in your area? Um, and if there are a, decent amount or a handful, then you're just overpriced. I mean, it doesn't matter. I don't care what anybody says about marketing and branding and PR. I I love it like more than anybody. But at the end of the day, even if you take condition away, price is what sells a property. A, a, a business person that's buying a $5 million property isn't going to overpay for it, generally speaking. Um, I don't care how awesome your marketing is. You're not going to get a million dollars more than what somebody thinks it's worth. Josh, do you do um, a broker's opens? Is that one of your strategies to get more agents in and at least get feedback for your seller? Yeah. Um, typically, I just call friends that and or agents I've worked with that work in that particular area and just ask them to meet me. Um, broker's opens have just become too difficult. Like we we've done them and bought all the food and done. And then like we get 26 RSVPs and three people show up. Yeah. And I would rather just meet people and say, Hey man, I'll bring you like, let's go to lunch afterward and just invite three or four people. That's less expensive for me and it's more efficient and I get as good or better information. Mm -hmm. um, I just think brokers opens. So I went on this appointment um, a couple of weeks ago, $5 million listing appointment. 
they're from California. And she said, so, so like how often or how many brokers opens are you doing? And I go, uh, nine. And she was like, well, that's all we do in California. And I said, I said, that's great. I said, your house is 47 minutes from my office, um, which, you know, not a problem, but it's on 27 or 28 acres. And you're, this just isn't a bunch, like, 90% of who I would invite aren't even people that sell like in this price range. And so like, I would rather just invite five people. And she was like, oh, that makes sense. Because it, I mean, a broker opens just, I think it's very, very market specific. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and on the type of property. I think if it's in a neighborhood that turns over and churns quite a bit, I think that's great. But I think that that's not, um, yeah, I think that's hard to do. And I think COVID's probably made that even weirder. Absolutely. For sure down here. Yeah. Um, Let's see, we've got a couple of other questions here. How often do you communicate with those prepping or if you know they are planning to list in April or May? Oh, I'm I'm like, I'm like lead follow-up master. I mean, I call people, I'm just checking in constantly. So um, it depends on where I am in the, that process. But um, if somebody says, hey, I'm, I'm thinking about selling in three months, they're getting calls from me like two weeks from that conversation, two weeks from that conversation. And it might not be all phone calls. But it might be a text message. It might be an email. It might be a market report. Um, but I'm, I'm touching them in some capacity and physically calling them um, at least every couple of weeks because... I know how quickly that can accelerate when somebody says three months. If they need to do something in three months, I should have been at their house a week or two ago is, is what I feel. Because I'm not sure if I haven't been to that property, I'm not sure what the, um, like what all they need to do. And I need to do a walkthrough. Mm-hmm. And once I do a walkthrough, then my wife's going to do a walkthrough because I pay her to do walkthroughs for me. It's really awesome. If you don't have somebody to do walkthroughs for you, you should you should set that up. So get a designer or stager to do a walkthrough. She typically is there for 15 or 20 minutes, walks through all the property, takes tons of pictures, jots down all the, you know, all her notes, and then puts a big email together of like room by room what to do. But it 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 it's another set of eyes and it allows me not to be the bad guy. You know, you know, we don't want to be the bad guy, right? right. So it's, uh, there's times when I'm like, oh, I want to tell her how bad this is. But yeah, um, so it's, it, it, and, and she knows, my wife knows that she's being the bad guy and she's happy to do it because she has no, like outside of me listing the property, she has no skin in the game, right? Um, so it's, it's, it's a good thing to do. And I would imagine most people on this call probably have somebody that can do that. Um, but definitely- Definitely, I do it for every listing, no matter what. I, even if it's new construction, I don't care. Wow, that's impressive. Every single one we do it ours, we do it here, um, but not for every single property. But for sure, it it makes that conversation a lot easier um, when it's not the agent giving the bad news; it's somebody else, and they're an expert. Like they're a third party who's an expert at that. You know, we're the expert at selling the house, so they don't want to hear it necessarily from us, but from a third party who that's what they do, they then they listen a lot better. A, a lot more actually ends up getting done when my wife does the walkthrough versus me saying, oh, you know, you could do this and you could do that. And, you know, I give them some stuff. I mean, we can all answer the general questions and like, you know, but she does room by room and she does stuff. She's like, yeah, karate chop your pillow. And I'm like, no you know, just random stuff. <laughs> Diane's laughing because she's met my wife. And <laughs> anyway, yeah. So, oh, that's funny. Um, but it, it does, it, it makes it a lot easier to do that. I mean, I do the listing appointments, obviously, but hey, I'm going to have my, have my stager do the walkthrough and they're going to give you room by room. And, you know, some of them only do half of it. Some of them do a little bit and some of them do everything to a T. And it's always amazing when you're like, yes, thank you. You did everything. Just do you go to your um, photography when when you're when the photographer is doing the pictures? Do you go to that or do you trust that the house is ready? I typically don't do that just because it, it depends on the property, but sometimes I do, but most of the times I do not. Um, just because it's already gotten to a point of 
I've been to the house. My wife's done either staging or accessories or done the walkthrough. And so it's, it's gotten pretty far into the process. And then, you know, if we get the pictures back and they're not what I thought, I'm just like, all right, we got to go back out. Mm-hmm. And, then I'll, and then I'll be there. But I'll, we've prepped our photographer and we've got three or four different photographers for different types of properties. Um, we've kind of prepped them on what they have the ability to do. Like you get to move all this stuff around in the kitchen. And so they do, they, they take care of a lot of stuff for us. That's great. Yeah. Um, Amy's asking if they do the walkthrough after the listing appointment. Yes. yes. There have been a couple of times then when uh, my wife has done the listing appointment with me just to knock it out because the people want to do it real quick. That doesn't happen very often just because of our schedules or she's as busy or busier than I am. I mean, she's working with like 25 or 30 other realtors in addition to our business, which, you know, I have my opinions on that, but anyway. <laughs> awesome. Well, well, she got my staging when I, I, I told her I wanted to buy this little bit of staging that's just for the Anderson group. And she's like, I don't, I don't have room for that. I'm sorry. I'm like, I don't get <laughs> Sounds uh, like fun. Yeah. Um, I think the last question we have is, do you use a sign-in sheet at opens? That's really interesting. So we've been trying to do QR codes. Um, We've historically always done sign-in sheets at opens um, and had really good success with it for the most part. I think it's just something about it being physical and you can hand it to them. Over the last month, we've been trying to do QR codes and it's like miserably failing. It's (laughs) They're just people are like, no, I don't want to do that. It's like, okay, well, we're going to capture your information either way. So I guess we'll go back to like paper, you know, sign in sheets. Sometimes the basics are just easier and more, more effective, even though it's cool to have the new technology, but it doesn't. My my director of operations really wants the QR code thing to work because it just drops directly into our CRM. Yep. And I love the idea, but it's just, it's not working so far. So, yeah. Um, and he said, uh, does she, she does a 15 minute walkthrough to do at that? No, she doesn't give, she doesn't, she doesn't really do any questions. She literally walks through the property, takes a ton of pictures, makes some notes and leaves. She's not, she made the mistake early on of doing actual walkthroughs room by room with like the husband or the wife. And she's like, okay, that's like two hours later because you have all these conversations in between. She's like, I'm not doing that. She's like, my walkthrough is 15 or 20 minutes. I walk around the exterior of the home and I walk through every room. I take pictures. I go home, put all of that in the form of an email and give them room by room suggestions. Yeah. Love it. Love it. Well, listen, I think we're, we're about out of time here, but um, Josh, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah. And um, for anybody who has referrals for Josh, you got to look him up. Your website is? Uh, it's joshandersonrealestate.com. Right. And if you forget that, he's easy to find in Nashville. Just search his name and you'll find it. And where are you going to be at um, Family Reunion, Josh? Um, I don't, I've don't. i got a customer experience or client experience panel that I'll be on. Um so if you guys see that one, it's, I think it's a uh, customer experience with Laura Jalot and myself and Scott Maloof. And um, yeah, if you guys want to reach out, I'd love to connect it at Family Reunion. I'm going to be there from Friday to Tuesday, I think. Awesome. Well, Josh, I will for sure be seeing you. And if anybody uh, wants to see any of the luxury panels, I'm going to be on a luxury panel on Saturday at 415. So hopefully we'll see a bunch of you guys there. And uh, Josh, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Happy Valentine's Day, guys. Thank you. You too. See ya. Bye.